All right, so we're going to record this broadcast tonight, and I think you guys are going to find this very interesting, at least I hope you do. Uh, we're going to be looking into uh, the book of Daniel, uh, especially after I had this very interesting uh, insight on Daniel 7.25, that what Daniel was speaking of there wasn't the, the one that comes to change the times and the law, that it's the law that we would typically think of, the Torah, but rather he had came, he would come to change uh, the time and the decree. And uh, we talked about that before, how a decree is something the king gives. It's not what uh, the Heavenly Father gave Moses, speaking of the Torah on Mount Sinai, but rather it is the decree uh, in this case, what he's speaking about is what Ezra, because you got to remember Ezra and Daniel were uh, prophets of Israel at the time that they were in captivity. And Ezra was writing about the decree when Israel was to go back and to restore and build Jerusalem again along with the second temple. And that's exactly what took place. And uh, that was the decree. But when Daniel comes in the chapter 7, verse 25, and I'm going to jump over here and we're going to start looking at some of these here real quick. Um, that's on the video, but let's jump here. Let's see, Daniel 7 right here. Um, I don't know if you guys see these things, but I need to move that out of the way. Put that on the bottom. And then we'll go down here real quick to verse 25 again here. So he says that uh, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, shall ten kings arise, another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the former, and he shall put down three kings, and he shall speak words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change the seasons and the law. And that word Right here, dot, it's just the two letters. Sometimes there's an aleph behind it, a vowel, but it doesn't change the pronunciation. But it says, and the law, the dot, which means a decree. It's only used really and truly three times in that form there, the book of Ezra, the book of Esther, and, of course, the book of Daniel. But in the book of the other day, I found uh, a, a similar form of that. In the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, we'll just go there for the sake of making sure we don't leave any stone unturned here. Uh, so let's see, Deuteronomy chapter 33. Uh, and here it says, uh, at his right hand was a fiery law unto them. Now, they have it broke down, already highlighted in Hebrew here as a breakdown of two different words. But it's actually written as one word right there, a shadat, which means a fiery decree. And as I spoke the other day about that, that because it comes from his, not so much his right hand, but uh, yamina, which is the, the letter in front of that, the mim means from. So it's from yamina. Uh, which means from his right or his right side. Now, you could take it a hand or a side, either one. But uh, what comes from his right side is this fiery law. And, of course, I type that out with that being a type of Christ. Uh, so I won't go into that too much here. But like I said, Daniel, we know that this, and this is really speaking of this Antichrist figure, in my opinion. When he says, and he shall think to change the seasons and the law, and they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a half a time. That's interesting. Now notice, he shall speak words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change the season and the decree. 
which the only decree that was given in the book of Ezra, we can't use the book of Esther because the book of Esther had nothing to do with the time frame of Israel being in Babylon. But Ezra does. And Ezra gives a decree as well, using the exact same word that Daniel uses here. And he gives a decree of the king, and that was to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem and the temple itself. And it was a set time that that was to be done. <clears throat> That's why he talks about the season. The season would be, it would be another time frame altogether in a future period of time, right? And we know this too, because Daniel later, he lets us know this was a vision that was for a later time. It wasn't even for that time, but a later time frame down, much further down. <clears throat> so what I want to do we're going to look at Daniel 9 and Daniel chapter 12 as well in comparison to this, because I think you're going to find this very interesting. Uh, here we are in Matthew 24. I'm going to start here with verse 13. We're going to continue on down through verse 15. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Notice that now. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. All right, so it seems to be, and we don't quite see that clearly here, but it almost seems to be that this, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, that that comes after the gospel being preached unto all the world. But it's kind of... <clears throat> A little bit loose there. We don't really know for sure. And the other question is, is where's what's Daniel, what, what is Jesus referring to when he talks about the abomination of desolation? Is he talking about chapter 9, where we get in verses 25 to 27 here about the 70 weeks of Daniel? When we find out there shall uh there shall be um uh a uh let's see unto one anointed a prince shall be. See, there's an anointed prince in verse 25 that comes. See, know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem until one anointed a prince. Literally, that's the word Mashiach. Ad Mashiach Nagid. Okay, Ad Mashiach Nagid means an anoint until an anoint, it can be until or unto. I normally translate odd as until. Uh, until Messiah prints, there will be 70 of weeks. And for three score and two weeks, it shall be built again with a broad place and a moat, but in troublous times. Now it separates the two. All right. And then we have further down two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. Excuse me, after three score and two weeks shall anointed one be cut off. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, if you notice, the ones that are going to destroy the sanctuary is going to be the people of a prince. Now, that's of a prince, a Nagid again, okay? that shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. But that's the people of that prince. And, and we have it right here. Am, Am Nagid, the people of the prince. Haba, they come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that would be referring to Titus, the Roman general because it's him and his people that come and actually destroy the, the temple. But his end shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall make firm a covenant with many for one week, and for a half of a week he shall cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. 
All right. Now, we don't really get any place in here. I mean, you get at the last part, calls of palmet, which means a desolation, the, the shamam right there. Al shamam means desolation. All right. Uh, but um, we don't really see that written in verse 27. But they also, if you follow your uh, concordance, it'll tell you also Daniel chapter 12. And uh, and let's see, I don't know. Maybe I used a King James version because King James is, uses the language a little bit. Let's see, that's chapter 9. Let me go to chapter 12. I want to use the King James because when they translate it, they don't mistranslate it in, um, in the Hebrew text in English but it's not using words that you would typically uh, think or, or would associate with that of um, the same words that uh, the King James Version uh, uses here. So anyway, so let's go down here and let's get down near, I think that's near the end, whoop, sorry. And let me find out exactly where it was at. All right, it is chapter 12. Uh, I think it's going to be verse 11. Let me just see here. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. All right. Now, the important thing to look at here, though, is at the time uh, the abomination that make a desolate is set up. All right, so we know he's referring to uh, verse 11 when Jesus talks about that. But in a way that's kind of, you might think, well, where are we going with this? All right, well, where we're going with it is we need to look at Matthew's gospel, the Hebrew gospel. And in here, we get it written a little bit different than what you have in the... Um, and the Greek version, and uh, those of you that know anything about Nehemia Gordon, you'll know that Nehemia has often stated that the, let's see if I can blow this up a little bigger. Nehemia has always stated that um, the Hebrew version of Matthew, you can tell by the idioms that it is far more accurate than that of the Greek. It flows It flows better when you read it in he, from the Hebrew version uh, to the English than it does in the other way around. So when I look at that, uh, what it makes me realize is that uh, the Hebrew version definitely uh, can give us some insight that we don't normally get in Greek. So when we go here to Matthew 24, let's read it now. We'll start with verse uh, 13 like we did in, in the uh, King James. Whoever waits until the end will be saved. And this gospel, that is Evangelii, will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations, and then the end will come. This is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place. Let the one who reads under stand. Now, what I noticed first off, two things. One, I'm sure you see already that in the Hebrew Matthew, he includes the word antichrist, not just the abomination of desolation. Secondly, the word this is the antichrist also seems to be a continuation of verse 14. So we read again, in this gospel, that is, Evangelii will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all the nations, and then the end will come, because what happens at the end? This is the Antichrist, in other words, at the end, the Antichrist is coming, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, let the one who reads understand. Now, I want to show you something, the way it's worded in Hebrew now because it's very interesting, all right? Right there, the very first word is they, which means this. This antichristos, 
He literally uses that word antichrist, but it's transliterated uh, in Hebrew, but he's using that terminology. This antichristos, vezehu shakuts, you know, saying we got people popping in here, try to, oh, how do I get them in without, I can't get them in because I keep, there we go, got them, all right. So he says, this Antichristos, okay, Vehu Shekutz Shemem, okay, that's talking about the, the, uh, the abomination of desolation, Haomer Alpe Daniel, okay, which is spoken uh, out of the mouth of Daniel, Omed, standing, Bemekum, in the place, Kodesh, that's holy, Veha uh, then he says, Veha Kore, which means, and the one who reads, Yabin. Now, we think of that, we normally it translates with understanding. He who reads, let him understand, is how we normally read that or, or see that. But it's not exactly what it's saying there. What it says here, Veha Kore, Yabin, it is he that has, uh, he who reads that has divine understanding in other words those that, that can read this that this, this has been revealed to them with a divine understanding is what it is so daniel is saying to us here let me kind of move us out of the way so i can get a hold of this so what jesus is i shouldn't say daniel but what jesus is saying when he's quoting daniel he said this is whoop i still didn't get it all the way over All right, there we go. So he says, this is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, this which was spoken, he says, by the mouth of Daniel. Standing in the holy place, let the one who can read with divine understanding. That would be the right way to translate that. And then we also notice that, uh, oh, hang on, i got somebody else trying to come in. Let me get this just right. There we go. So the person, that, so we know now that the Antichrist is the one that's going to be standing in the, the place where it calls the abomination, which desolates, okay? But he's going to be standing in the holy place. Now, the Antichrist, everybody knows that the Antichrist comes at the end of days. And if he's going to be standing in the holy place, now it kind of coincides back with a lot of people, what a lot of people say. They, a lot of people tell you, especially ministers, well, we know that there's going to be a third temple built, but the issue is, is that eventually the Antichrist is going to stand in that temple and he's going to declare himself as if he's God. Well, Jesus just told you right here that the Antichrist is going to stand where he, and he quotes that the abomination which desolates, and he said it's going to be standing in the holy place. Now, when you consider that, and we go back over here to Daniel chapter 7, and we read here, and he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And he shall think to change the season and not the law, but the word dot is decree. And they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a dividing of time. So what's going to happen is that the Antichrist, now we know it's going to be the Antichrist is the one who will stand in the holy place and he will think that he's able to change the times and the laws, okay? He thinks he can actually do that. But the thing is, is it's given into his hand, but here's what's the scary part. Who wants to build the third temple? I mean, that's obvious. It's Israel. I shared the other day when I did a video um, let me see if I can pull that up real quick. Uh, 
when I did the, let's see, what video was that? Let's see, manage videos. Uh, okay, I think, I think it's on this one right here. Let me just see. All right. No, no, oh, maybe not. Let's see, though, maybe. Yep, it is right here. All right. On this one right here, uh, this, and I was given permission to use this, just not to show the face of the welder that's actually fabricating this. These are some of the doors that they are building right now for the third temple. That's going on right now. All right. So they are building it. Um, and the thing is, hang on one second here. Um, so they're actually building this third temple. They're getting it ready. And he explained to me that they've got a lot of contracts already uh, for the different things that they're building there and that they're in full swing right now of, um, of building the third temple. And so the thing is, is that, um, um, hang on one second here. Okay. So the thing is, is that they're, they're, they're building the third temple and it's Israel that's building the third temple. And if we see, in other words, building the third temple in itself, a lot of ministers would say, even though they'd say, oh, the Antichrist will actually stand in the third temple and declare himself to be God. Um, so they would know the third temple is going to be built, and they would think it's a godly thing for the third temple to be built, but they would know, okay, the Antichrist is going to use it. Well, we come to find out, though, according to Daniel's chapter 7, verse 25, though, that the third temple, yes, it is going to be built, but it's only going to be built because that one that is a part of the uh, the fourth kingdom that Daniel speaks about that's going to be on the earth, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So the fourth kingdom they're going to have a guy, which will be the Antichrist himself, that's going to raise up, who, who think, who, excuse see, and he, what's really important here is to realize that, let me get it to the right spot here. Um, he will think to change the time or the season and the law. So, and where we have that right, it's this. let me get the right word for you here so you can see this here. That right there, that lets us know it's one person. And the reason we know it's one person is because of this letter right here, the Yod, by itself. That means he, and he, Sabal, okay, uh, he thinks that he can take and change the season and the decree. Not the word law. It's not, it says dot right there in purple. It doesn't say Torah. And if you go through the scripture in the Hebrew language and just look up the word law, you know, practically every single word in the entire Old Testament is the word Torah, unless it's referring to father-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, mother-in-law. Each one of those words is a different type of word for the word law because it's not really a law like the word Torah. And then other than that, then you only have one other form, and that's the word dot, uh, dalit tav, which, which means a decree. It doesn't actually mean a law. I mean, we could take it as a law, but in the context of Torah versus a decree of a king, it's two different things altogether. So this one... A singular person is thinks that they can change the season and the decree. And that decree, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, for those of you that joined in a little bit later, is thinking that they can change the decree that was given by Ezra, the prophet. Well, Ezra didn't give the decree. 
it was Artaxerxes who gave the decree. And actually, I believe by that time it was Cyrus who gave the, you know, because we know this, you ever remember the little Cyrus cylinder that they found? Uh, it's actually in Great Britain in the museum there. I actually, I have actually seen that for myself. It's not that big either. It's only about like that, right? A little bitty thing. Well, they dug that up. They put that on display. And on that Cyrus cylinder, that's where Cyrus is talking about that uh, that the God of heaven had told him to send all the peoples. And it wasn't just the Jews. It was all the peoples back to their lands of their nativity. But in particular, though, when it comes to Israel, he was they were going to help them to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple as well. And it actually uses the word dot, that the King Cyrus gave a dot, a decree to do that. So that was the decree that Daniel is speaking about here in chapter 7, verse 25, that this one that comes along, he thinks he can change that and the decree. In other words, he can change the season of when it's supposed to be done. And the fact of the decree that the king gave, he could he can decree it for another time frame, in other words. And then you have someone like Netanyahu, they call him king of the Jews. And of course, what are they trying to do? They're trying to convert Israel from a democracy to a theocracy. And they don't make any bones about it. That is actually publicized in Israeli media that Netanyahu, he's even admitted it, that they want to turn the government to a theocracy. They want it to be led by a king. And if, if it stays going this way, Netanyahu would be the king of Israel. And if he declares that they're going to have the third temple built, and I don't think... I. I I kind of feel like it will not be Netanyahu, because to me, he's not an Antichrist figure. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think he is. But whoever comes in as that king, he's going to try to change the time, or the season, as it's called there, and the decree. He will establish, the reason why it says change of the decree, because the decree was to build the temple, the second temple, back, what, 2,500 years ago not 2,000 years ago. So this is where the problem comes in. But the beautiful thing is, is now we're actually starting to see it, though. You know what I mean? This, this is the beautiful part about it. Now we're actually seeing what they're doing. And that's what the real um, amazing thing is. Because now, now that we see that, and we know this is supposed to happen, and then... We look at the Hebrew Matthew because Jesus does say, just like we have in the in the Greek version of Matthew, and when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel, the, uh, the prophet, stand in the holy place. What's the abomination of desolation? You know, the word abomination is something filthy. The word desolation, shamam, is just something that's going to annihilate and do away with. But all we see in the Greek, Matthew, is just the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place. For us, we don't know. We might have thought that's a statue or something. I mean, I'm sure some people figured it's the Antichrist. I don't know if they do or don't. I haven't really studied to see what other people think on that matter. But when you look at the Hebrew, Matthew, now we know it's the Antichrist because Daniel says, or excuse me, Jesus says plainly there, this is the Antichrist and this is the abomination which desolates. What's the abomination that desolates? The Antichrist. Jesus is clearly telling you he is the abomination which desolates. It's the Antichrist. And when does it happen? After this gospel that is, Evangelii will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations, and then the end will come. You know what's fascinating? Jesus says it's going. This this all is going to basically happen after the gospel has been preached to all the earth as a witness concerning him to all the nations. Then the end will come. 
The fascinating thing of this is when the Antichrist steps on the scene, one of the things that he does, he puts an end to the gospel of Jesus Christ being spoken. Now, if you think about it, that's exactly what you get with those seven laws. I'm going to be careful what I speak about here, but uh, that's exactly what they do. Remember, you lose your head if you violate any of those. That's what it plainly says, okay, in these books right here that I have. All right, let, let me just close the screen so you can see this a little bit better. These books right here, that's Sencino, all right? And in that book right there, that book right there, I've got the whole 20-something volumes of these. That's where you find those laws that are spoken about. They're written in there. And if you violate one, if in other words, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that's blasphemy according to that law. And you know what the punishment is. So just think about it. Think about what position you find yourself in. And now you know from, like I said, what we just shared a second ago here, now you know from Daniel chapter 7, I'm kind of repeating myself mainly just so it really kind of sticks a little better. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25, the one that he that thinks to change the season and the law is not the Torah. Is See, a lot of people always had it in mind, and that's why the mistranslation uh, of the, or not mistranslation, but the misunderstanding of this prophecy is that this one that would come, he's going to try to manipulate the word of God, in other words. This is where uh, one group would say, well, the Catholic Church can't be right because they changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and so therefore they're the one. It's the Pope that breaks this. That's what they would argue. It's not the Pope. Because it's not the Torah that he's changing. It's the decree. All it's speaking of is that he is going to change the time frame of what, in other words, Cyrus meant for the temple to be built when they went back 2,500 years ago. This guy comes along and says, no, Cyrus meant for you to build it nowadays. He may not even quote Cyrus for that matter. But the thing is, that's why it's a change of not only the season, but the decree itself. He authorizes the building of the third temple. And quite frankly, you don't need a third temple. That's another decree that he's doing, right? He's changing the decree because who's the other king that he's changing that decree on? King Jesus. King Jesus said, the Most High dwells not in a temple made by hands, but a body, right? He quotes that scripture. See, we live in him. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you become, you become part of the temple itself. You are the temple. We're just different members of that temple. We're a different stone in the temple. But it's a lively stone. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Christ living in us. So he gave a decree of what the true temple was. He also spoke how that the second temple would be destroyed and there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. Paul spoke about the temple as well. That we were members of that temple, of his body. So that's the other decree that gets changed as well. Jesus gave that decree that we're a part of his body, that we are that temple. So he comes to also alter his decree. So it's kind of like a twofold thing. But now we know because Jesus identified him in the Hebrew Matthew that he's the Antichrist that does this. The Antichrist will actually be the very one that authorizes the building of the third temple. That's all you got to watch for. And by the way, this whole ordeal of a war with Lebanon right now, I haven't double-checked yet to see, 
but I have a strong suspicion um, that, and let me just, here we've got another person popped in here. So, but I have a very strong suspicion that the war with Lebanon is being provoked intentionally. Now, Lebanon has been lobbing rockets over at Israel and stuff, you know, because they're very angry over what's happening with Gaza. But they just haven't gone into an all-out assault. But more recently, Nasrallah, their leader, has talked about firing rockets at Dimona, the nuclear power plant, also where it is believed that Israel has uh, materials or weapons stored also of a nuclear nature. So they have talked about targeting that. Well, in order to get to Demona, you got to kind of shoot over Jerusalem. So my thought has been that what their plan is, is to take out, we'll just call it the dome. I don't want to say any words that raise red flags here, but we'll call it the dome. If somebody will use a false flag to take out the dome, and blame it on Hezbollah that a missile went wayward and hit it. Now that will cause such an uproar in the Middle East that the war will go completely bonkers. Israel might even lose Jerusalem for a short period of time. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they don't. Why? Because under that circumstances there, they may get a retaliation like never before. And it won't just be Lebanon. It may be Syria. It may be Jordan. It could be a whole bunch of other nations there in the Middle East that freak out over that being destroyed. But the U.S. and the other NATO allies will come to her aid and she'll regain control. They may even declare peace and they may even declare some type of autonomy with the Palestinians, which the Palestinians would embrace for the first time. But somewhere on there, somebody's going to talk about building that third temple. And whoever declares that to be so, that will be your Antichrist. That's how you'll be able to identify him. So you will know him before the temple is built. Unless, of course, they keep it quiet on who's doing it. But it doesn't appear that way. To me, it appears like you'll know who it is because Daniel's already told you. He will think to change seasons and the decree. And as I find it very fascinating is as I shared with you. And there's also, by the way, I'm going to take y'all back to the scripture here for a moment. Besides Jesus using the same verbiage, um, trying to figure out a way to move you guys down to where I can reach it. There we go. Like I said, Jesus uses the verbiage right here. Uh, oh, I can highlight it. Look at there, good deal. He says, Hakorei, Hakorei Yabim. He who can read the word Bim, Bet Yud Nun. This was actually Joshua's last name. He was actually, it's part of his last name. Uh, Joshua is called Bin Nun. Uh, my name is Bin Nun. Mine means son of Nun. His was Bin Nun. And even though it's typically considered to be son of Nun, it actually is a word for divine understanding. And it is believed that Joshua was given that spelling intentionally because he had a divine understanding of the words of Moses. All right. Now, I think, and I don't know if I can find it quick enough, but I'll try real quick. Let me try. I don't know if it's in chapter seven or where it's at, but let's see here. Somewhere in here, again, it is used, maybe it was chapter 12. Um, oh, there was something in chapter 12. I just saw that I had it highlighted. I wanted to bring to your attention as well. Okay. Uh, 
Ah, oh, by the way, here it is. That was I was looking for that one too. All right. But they that are wise shall understand, right? But they that are wise shall understand. The word understand right there it is in the plural, speaking about they. That's the little vav at the end. It actually means or uh, uh, the vav with the little dagish there, a little dot. That's where it means they. But again, it's the word being. And so it's they that are wise with divine understanding. So it's not just any kind of understanding. Basically, it's like revealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what that's the type of understanding that you would have. Now, another thing that I also caught that I wanted to share with you real quick before we close on this is when you read in here, and from the time that the continual burnt offering shall be taken away, and by the way, I highlighted in yellow there, and you see all the spaces, that's because all these other words are not in there, right? Um, well, the and is there. I'll take it back. And from the time. So it does say that. Ooh, me, uh, me et. Okay, that means and from the time. Uh, but the, that the continual, the word burnt offering shall be, it's not even in the verse. It's assumed that it means that. Uh, taken away. And the detestable thing that causes appallment or the abomination that makes desolate would be the correct way to say that. And by the way, we the thing that causes, or when I use the word makes, the abomination that makes desolate, the word makes is not there either. Abomination, desolation. All right, that's it right there in green. Uh, shakutz, shaman. All right, shakutz, shaman which means abomination of desolation. But then we have on here, set up, there shall be, they put on there, there shall be 1,290 days. That's this part right here. Elef me'atim v'toshim. All right, that's the 1,290 days. But what they don't mention, and they never translate in here, is what I put in black, the word yamin. And that's kind of interesting to me why they don't translate it. And I don't really know an answer to this as of right now, uh, because it's the word days, plural. Uh, normally, when you say yamim, it's many days. All right. And then they go into this set time. But it's only after breaking up this right here, the abomination of desolation of many days. So. My question is, is it connected to the 1,290 days? Is that what the writer meant when Daniel wrote it? Was he meaning that when he said many days? Or did he mean something else by it? I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, but I figured I'd bring that up to you guys because it's a very significant word. And it should have been translated. And it doesn't matter if you look at it in King James or if you look at it in the Hebrew or the Hebrew English translation, which I'm showing you now. Um, if you go down here, uh, again, uh, the, the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be, and then it never says a word about the Yamin, many days. It doesn't say there shall be many days and then say 1,290 days. So I don't know. I don't know if that's something additional and then a time starts uh, or if it's implying that that's many days because of 1,290 days. It's very unusual because I don't know of any other place in Scripture where it actually says that before giving a specific number of days. So that's why I'm a bit confused by that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to close all that off for now. Uh, let me stop that screen there and give you guys a chance. If y'all got a question or something you want to ask, please, please feel free to ask. I'll go to the gallery there. And if I could answer any questions, I'll try to do so.